Hi, my name is Kit Rackley. My pronouns are they, them, and I am from the United Kingdom. So the Anthropocene, it's unique period of Earth's history in which humans are one of the dominant forces of nature. But the debate is still feverish whether we should be formally designating the current period of history with this term. And perhaps it's a term of arrogance too. Are we having such a profound impact on our planet that when, not if, decay sets in, our mark will be forever present? So let's take a look. The concept of the Anthropocene has been around among scholars for over 150 years, but it was Soviet meteor mineralogist and geochemist Vladimir Vodansky, who in the 1920s first pioneered the thought that living organisms could reshape the planet as surely as physical force. He was a man who was so dedicated and passionate that um, despite all of the aspects of the early 20th century that impacted his, early, his everyday life, and on top of this, his work was actually largely dismissed by the West until decades later. But he is recognized as pretty much the father of environmental sciences, which is something close to my heart because I've got a degree in that. So scientific controversy was as rampant then as it is today. Now, fast forward to 2011, and a Nobel Prize for chemist winner said this, it is a pity we're still living in the age called the Holocene, the Anthropocene, human dominance of biological, chemical, and geological process on Earth is already an undeniable reality. Now, he got into an argument with some of his colleagues, which made his blood boil. This passion and arrogance came from Dutch chemist Paul J. Crutzen. Months later, this snarling, fire breathing person teamed up with American biologist Eugene Stromer and expanded and popularized the concept of the Anthropocene. But OK, let's just move the origin story to the side and turn to concepts. Let's use Crazy Horse's arm for scale. If Earth's lifespan, all 4.5 billion years of it, is his armpit, then the Cambrian explosion, the trilobites didn't occur until the knuckles. Then here's the dinosaurs on their upper finger with the meteor strike 65 million years ago at the end of that. And we didn't come about until the distals of the fingernail. So that's the bit that overhangs your, that sticks out and overhangs. And us trolling the earth, <laughs> well, that didn't really occur until microscopic parts of it. So next time you bite your fingernails, you've just erased all of human history. Now, <clears throat> okay, I'm a bit of a sci-fi fan, a bit of a fancy fan. Um, so here's a bit of a thought experiment from The World Without Us by Alan Wiseman, a really good book from 2009. So I want you to just think of this. What if Thanos, instead of getting rid of, oh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Infinity War, Infin Avengers Infinity War, spoiler alert there. If Thanos decided to click his fingers and get rid of everybody instead of just half of the, of the human population, what might actually happen? What would setting decay wise and what kind of legacy would we leave? What would our, of our arrogance would be left behind? Well, let's take a look at this, shall we? What might endure? So start from something on my side of the pond here, the channel tunnel or the channel as we called it, which connects England and France. And it's built within the rock underneath the English channel. Now it may actually remain passable for a while to allow migrating animals until sea level rise floods the French end. But continental movements after about a million years will be the death knell for it. Now, but what it does, it does tickle me to think that it would great Nigel Farage, Brexit stalwart, to learn that this physical legacy of joining Britain to Europe will, lo will long outlast his efforts to separate the EU and the United Kingdom. Sorry, Nigel. Okay, so what about everyday stainless steel items such as? Nunchucks. What about odor bars to get rid of that pesky sulfur smell? What about chainmail gloves? Now these would last millions of years if they ended up being buried and fossilized. This one, Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Now it's carved out of granite with intrusions of pegmatite, especially resistant to weathering, eroding only one inch for every 10,000 years. So noses will be gone within 2.5 million years, Heads would lose their definition around 7 million years. Typical, isn't it? It appears to me of privilege that a monument to a bunch of white cisgender old dudes would last for so long. So let's decolonize that. 
the monument to Crazy Horse, also made out of pegmatite granite. It's planned to be larger and more defined than Rushmore, so let's get Crazy Horse finished before Thanos, and so we can outlast those colonials, eh? This one, oh, I know I'm cheating here, but the human artifact that is most likely to last into billions of years is within an environment that lacks weathering and erosion agents. Activity on the moon, but knowing our luck, probably a meteor strike will blow all that up. Now, okay, I haven't covered the usual sub suspects, atmospheric carbon, petrochemicals, mass extinction, because they get enough coverage as it is. So let's just focus on the root of these, human arrogance. And we can flip the title of this talk. Does it cause decay? So maybe the Anthropocene shouldn't be an era, but more like an event, like the, the meteor strike that hit the um, Earth and caused the extinction event, the KPG extinction event. So here it is with a Swiss Army knife of scale, just that little thin sliver. So sticking with scale, here we go again. Let's make these extinction events thickness on these lines to represent how long they've actually lasted. So focusing on my finger here, here's the, uh, the meteorite. Here's us trolling the earth. Well, <clears throat> if we be generous and say, go back to the, the agricultural revolution, that's 15,000 years since then. And 185,000 years is the gap between seeing dinosaur fossils and the new mammals. Well, that's 12 times more time span than what we're doing currently right now. So, <clears throat> but it must be said that with extinction events like the KPG boundary and the dinosaurs, now, once that happened, there was an explosion of life. When the dinosaurs went, then the niche that was left behind by all these dead animals were filled in with all these, with, with these mammals. So let's think of this, with current events, how might evolution take place? How might it, it grow from our decay? Well, to quote Star Trekking from 1987, it will be life, Jim, but not as we know it. Here's some possibilities from a BBC article. I'm British, I love the BBC, so this is pretty good. Let's see, look at a few of these examples. So, the climate will be changed, things will be hotter, things will be, you know, animals might need to try and pull moisture out of, out of the air. So think of this, larger animals might evolve things like extended sails or skin flaps that could extend out of the early morning to capture the moisture. Now that is from Patricia Brennan, who's an evol evolutionary biologist. Now the frilly collars of some lizards, for example, could become very large and exaggerated to gather water in this way. So here's my mock-up. How about the frilled necked lizard from New Guinea and Australia plus fog harvesting nets in Peru equals the fog net necked lizard. I don't know. Looks quite pretty, doesn't it? Right, okay, so what about this, which you may or may not have heard of, the 19th century ho hoax of the Madagascar man-eating tree or the myth of the Yatavel, the latter being a carnivorous tree with huge poisonous spines. Well, we already have today the walking palm tree native to Central and South America, and of course the famous Venus flytrap. So who knows within a million of years or so evolution. Indulge me one more time. With potential long-term disruption to habitats, there may be a necessity for species to habitat switch. Consider a toad whose gullet swells outwards, large gas bag used to make mating cores. All seen planet Earth. Now, what if that toad evolved to be able to fill its gas bag with hydrogen from the water so it can hop further, even float? No longer a need for legs. So maybe they become tentacles and through natural selection, they become bigger to survive predators. Result, a zeppelinoid. Woof. Now they would become predators themselves ensnaring their prey and their tentacles. Here's a deer for scale. Ooh. It's quite scary, isn't it? Okay. Now I began with a quote from Crutzen, which on behalf of humanity has a tone of arrogance. But to end, I'll return to Vladimir Vodansky, who in 1945, the year of his death said, the whole of mankind put together represents an insignificant mass of the planet's matter. Its strength is derived not from its matter, but from its brain. 
If man understands this and does not use his brain, his work for self-destruction and his an immense future is open before him in the geological history of the biosphere. So, I would say that's a warning to humanity of their arrogance. Now, life will go on after decay, whether it be mass extinctions from geological upheaval, asteroid strikes, or sheer bloody arrogance. And so I'd like to give us a little bit of hope with a toast. And that is we may feel that the events of today is causing decay in some form or another. And what comes next may be inconceivable or uncertain. What appears to be inevitable is that from decay becomes rebirth and an explosion of diversity and evolution. So here's to what comes next. Cheers. <laughs>